Hi, welcome everybody to this very, very special interview for me. First of all, it's our it's our 10 year anniversary. If you didn't know that, Peter, 10 years ago, you and I met uh, for the first time at uh, New York City's uh, Professional Development Day for PMI. Wow. 10 years. Really? That's amazing. That's amazing. So if, if you look down to your left, I got a special gift there for you. No, I don't. I, I didn't get you anything. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> it's wonderful to see you. I'm here with the finalist for the PMO Influencer of the Year. And, and I love that word influence. Uh, if you guys don't know me, I'm not the influencer. I'm Rick Morris. I uh, own R Square Consulting. But with our finalist, Peter Taylor. So Peter, when did you like first really think about or start to wonder if you had a voice or what really got you into becoming the influencer you are today? Um, I, 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 we should be, we should be honest in these things. <laughs> I, we, I, we definitely we, need to be honest. I went to, a, I went to a, a project management conference. Uh, I, I missed it. I kind of went cause I was looking for a bit of a holiday. I was, I, I was leading a, a PMO, building a PMO, lots of challenging projects. And I persuaded my boss to, 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 you know, cover the bill to send me to uh, a big European conference. I went to the conference and I sat in session after session and uh, um, I was a little disappointed in the speaker, shall we say, if I'm, if I'm truly honest. And then of course, when you get like, you go, well, okay, can I criticize? Can I do better? And a number of things came, came to, together. And Richie, it was around that time I was beginning to get the ideas for the lazy project manager. I was working with a PMO, lots of people in that PMO, over a hundred project managers. And I was analyzing the way they were working. Some were working with crazy hours. Some were working normal hours on average. You know, what was different? What was behavioral difference? And suddenly it, it just all came together. This con concept of the lazy project manager, productive laziness, this opportunity to challenge myself to go out and write and also speak. Um, and it kind of kicked off from there. And that's, that is, you know, just over 11 years ago. I was going to say, so what year did the lazy project manager come out? Yeah, that came out in uh, 2009. And so my book at the time was it came out in 2008. So we were both kind of on our, our uh, book tour, right? Getting, getting the word out about that kind of stuff, but have very similar messages. I think that's why we connected. Um, and, and I we, I, we, met, we met again, I think it was, was it, I think it was either, either Washington or Dallas. I can't remember now, but at the big year, uh, US conference, yep. and I know you were selling your, selling your big promo, book, promoting your book there. And um, yeah, so that was Washington DC when that oh, book right, came out. Yep. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah. then uh we we spoke in uh poland together as well we did Warsaw, yeah. Poland. Yeah, that was a nice one that was in the football stadium wasn't it yeah and i've got stories after stories for that but that's for another time a um so a whole different interview <laughs> that's a whole different interview yeah. that one's over beers soon um but let's talk about the the word influence you know one of the things that that i like to say from stage is that I think the number one skill set a project manager needs to develop is their influence because they're, it's not our team. It's not our budget. It wasn't, you know, even our idea. So the only thing that we really have is influence. Talk about um, some of the things that you feel like you've done to speak into influence and some of your you know favorite tips and tricks that you share with some of the project managers around influence. Yeah, you're right, actually. And, uh, you know, I, I talk a lot about this, you know, the, you know, the book, most of my books are around the softer side of project management, about the fact that projects are about people. And, and of course, project managers, you know, you don't have direct responsibility probably for anybody that is working on your project team. That's very rare. You might have a, an assistant or a deputy or something like that, but that's about it. Pretty much everybody else, you can only persuade them to you know, commit and, and to work and to do, do a great job through influence. So it's kind of been a natural thing i feel like you know i, I guess i'm kind of lucky I, I had those kind of inherent skills i was reflecting actually because you know obviously been around for a while now and i was talking at a conference a couple of years ago to someone of similar generation to me another accidental project manager and and we were reflecting on how on earth we were how do we survive in the early years because you know i don't know what it was like with you rick but you know i was i was called a project manager way before i realized what it even oh, yeah. meant I was, uh, I, it was, I think it was eight years. I was doing this job. I can look back now and realize before I was sent on my first training course to learn to become a project manager. So, you know, the way we reflected that was, you know what? We, we were, we talked and we learned the mechanics of project management. We must have had a kind of general 
competence in the area of people and people skills and one of those is i mean i you can break it it's all around communication it's all about uh, negotiation uh, it, it's all about persuading people to do stuff um that they may or may not realize they want to do and, and influence is a, is a huge part of that of course so you know i i say it's the greatest lie we were ever told like every single project manager every one of us have heard the line you own the project mm -hmm. <laughs> and we when you look at it you peel that back you don't own anything there's not one the only thing i own is the blame for when it goes wrong that's yeah, it there's nothing the, else own the potential for project failure absolutely there's i love it because i yeah you know, most of my life i spent in the um sort of you know the commercial world uh, working for some major major software companies um of course most of our projects are client facing and and there's a thing that goes on and it's like uh and, you know, and, and sometimes the, the sales cycle is really quite you know, quick. Sometimes it's very long. It can be months or even even years in some cases. Um, and you know what I love is that point of what I could, you know I say you know that magical ha moment happens because despite the you know the hundreds of phone calls and emails and documents and meetings and discussions and promises all the rest of it, the moment you're appointed as project manager, it's your fault if it goes wrong. And it's yep. like, okay, how does that happen? <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's one of the one of the I know it's, it's it's kind of what makes project management exciting as well. Yeah, but then you've you you've experienced what I've experienced too, where when we get introduced and then you find out what's been promised during the sales cycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh god, yeah, there's there's a there's a great story. I mean, the latest project manager's got every chapter's got a story about where I completely screwed things up and learned an important lesson when I was trying to share with people. But there's one in there exactly that. I, I worked on a huge project and uh yeah, there, there was this one senior, you know, he was a he was a senior person, he was one of the you know relatives of the founders of the company, and he was determined he was gonna get one particular piece of functionality. I kept telling him it's not. In the, it's not in the scope it's not in the document you signed off like i can show you all the meeting minutes and the, the documents itself and you know, and go away and then a few months later you come back and go what about this what about this particular functionality you know david we spoke about this do you remember i showed you the yeah you go away he was such a nice guy and then uh, when we got to the final contractual meeting etc where we kind of signed off and they made most of the bulk payment i mean <laughs> you know this nice old gentleman screwed me over rightly royal because <laughs> he basically said no we're not signing anything and nobody else is going to argue with him. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it was an expectation that had been set in his mind and he was not going to let it go. Wow. Yeah. So you, you said something, um, as, as you were getting into that about the lazy project manager. And, and I think that that's the secret sauce. So if, if, if I wanted to give advice to people who want to start to, to maybe they're thinking and they're watching the two of us going, you know, they're not particularly special or they, they I, I can do better than them. Just like you and I did. Cause it, it, was the same, but yeah. <laughs> it was the same experience for me. I was in a huge conference. I watched a guy, I saw what we were paying him. I was a VP of programs and I was like, mm -hmm. I think I can do better. Right. But, but the point being is that in the lazy project manager, you said every chapter was about a failure. Yeah. And I think that's the secret sauce when we're trying to educate each other is to when you're up there going, I've never failed as a project manager, which is just an outright lie. Then you're not a real project manager if you've oh, never oh. failed. But um, talk about uh, you, you just gave me that. One, what's the one what's the one story that still hurts? What's the what's the, what's the one kind of failure or thing that you look back and, and maybe knowing what you know now, you would do some things differently. But what's that one that still bothers you? They okay. I mean, the one that still one that still hurts, and it wasn't my fault. <laughs> no, sure, it wasn't my fault. Let's be very clear about this. So, so you know, the, the quick scenario was: I was working. Uh, I'd taken over a project from someone, and and the essence of this story is: this is the only project I was ever removed from. So mm -hmm. I took over this project. The project was was clearly um, struggling. I did all of the due diligence of looking at the original documents, where we were, talked to everybody, etc. I had a I had a couple of consultants, a DBA, a consultant on site, etc. Um, and I I sat down and I'd worked out why this project was going to be late. Going to be late by about three months, I think it was. And I had this beautifully laid out. And actually. The vast majority of reasons was it was the client. The client didn't do this, didn't agree to this, didn't have this meeting, didn't approve this, didn't get this piece of equipment. It's a beautiful, I create this beautiful story, beautiful story. And I was ready and I, and I, I took, got my team together and said, look, I need to go off site. I've got another client down the road. I'm having a quick meeting with them. I'm coming back and then I'm meeting the, you know, the client project sponsor, the client project manager, and I will explain to them why this project is going to be late. And I'll tell them exactly when this project is going to be delivered based on the resources and everything I know feeling really confident um i went off site i came back I came back as i walked into reception my my beautiful wonderful 
tech DBA specialist consultant waved at me and he said, oh, by the way, he said, I just met the um, the client project manager over lunch. I told him the project's going to be three months late and he wants to see you right now. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, I went in there and I told them and I did this, but I was on the back foot. I was yep. on the back foot for that moment and it was, it was my fault. It was my company's fault. It was the software's fault. It was everything. It was nothing. None of it was their fault. And 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 shortly after that, in for, for political reasons, I was I was replaced, and I was, the third project manager came in, and the third project manager delivered it on a on a date. I yeah. said it would be, and so you know, what, what my biggest frustration mistake was: don't trust anybody else to put <laughs> on news like that. Don't leave a site. Don't don't walk away. Have that meeting quickly. So yeah, that I must admit that one's still like oh, it, it kind of rankles a little bit. Yeah, they're still. I, I didn't mean to do that. It, it's it's later where you are than it is for me. So maybe you can have a quick drink, and I'll, I'll get you back into a different mood. But I, I always love to hear yeah. the, the those oh, my, stories. And the, and the guy honestly believed he was doing me a favor. I mean, sure. <laughs> sure. And, and heart was certainly in the right place. Oh, you yeah, can't you can't fault that. Absolutely. But yeah, there's been yeah. many of those. What's one of your uh, favorite things that you do when you implement a PMO? A lot of us have our own tips and tricks and tools mm -hmm. and things like that. But when you're taking over a PMO, what what's that one policy or two policies that comes with you regardless of the client? Uh, so I've never taken over a PMO. I've always built a PMO. I'm, it's kind of fortunate and it's kind of my mm -hmm. forte. It is designing, engineering, building, recruiting the PMO team. So I've been, I've been lucky. I, not, I did, I've consulted on some existing PMOs. Sure. But right. The one thing I do, I mean, I, I'm a, I, you know, I developed it in the book Leading Successful PMOs. It is what I call the balanced PMO. It's the five P's and, and the five P's are very simple. Um, you've got to think about people. You've got to think about process. You've got to think about performance. You've got to think about promotion. You've got to think about your project management, information system, tools, whatever. And, and it, I, I say it's balanced because, you know, start with people and process. So, you know, if you get if you focus totally on the people, it, perhaps it's a little soft. It's not strongly governed. Maybe it's not the right sort of control. But of course, if you focus on only on the process, then you're known as the you know the project police very very quickly. So the first balancing that is to get people and process in the right balance. And then you know PMOs being what they are, particularly with you know when you're building from greenfield, you have to promote what the PMO is doing and what the value it is because the organisation has got a clue. I mean, you know, it's it's. And I guess you know, most of the listeners or, or, or to this will, will know uh, Mr. Bean and the uh, Rowan Atkinson's comedy character. It's a bit like Mr. Bean right at the beginning when, he, when that light comes down and Mr. Bean suddenly appears. We don't know if he's actually human or not. He's just weird. Yeah. PMO is a bit like that. They suddenly appear inside an organization. The, the, the CEO wants one or whatever. And everybody else is going, what, the, what on earth is this thing going to do? What does PMO even stand for? So promotion is very, very important. Performance tracking, you know, performance tracking of the project managers, of the projects, of the portfolio, and of the PMO itself is equally important. And the fifth one is obviously, you know, getting the right tools. So, you know, I say if build everything on that very simple model. And what you've got is a very um, simple one slide PMO roadmap that just talks about the initiatives to support each of those five Ps. And of course, behind it then is is a proper roadmap with timelines and objectives and stuff like that and responsibilities. But for me, it's always worked in the sense you can have this very simple explanation of what the PMO is trying to achieve. And I liked I liked the order of that. So in my career, what I wanted to try to do was impact the PMO. But I got into software implementation of PPM tools. I've done 150 mm -hmm. of those knowing that most companies are buying the software thinking that that's going to solve their project management problems when it, it is the people it is the process this is just yeah. the entry point in um so the people in the process if, if you're buying software without having great processes then you're just automating poor processes and, and making the project fail faster essentially <laughs> at the end of the day yeah I mean, um, each of, in each of my cases um the it, true investment in tools has always been one of the last things we've done and I, it's kind of like what you just said, you know, I always, I said, argued that until we know what we want, we can't go to market and, and no tool is going to be perfect. You know, let's, let's, let's be honest and clear here. Um, they all have strengths and weaknesses, but until we know what we want, why would we go and invest in something? And usually it's, you know, it's, it's a year or so into, the, into the, the journey of the PMO that we actually go out there and start looking in real detail at some of the key, key tools. In the meantime, I typically use the tools that are available, which are obviously typically Office tools or SharePoint, Jira, stuff that's already inside the organization. And then once we know what we need, once we know, as you said, we know the processes we want to manage, let's go and choose the, choose the tool. 
And the result of that, they typically tend to be pretty fast implementations when they happen. Yeah, I normally uh, would start with writing my own database just until I understood what it was that we were going to really track. Because everybody kind of says they care about all these different things, but that one prevailing metric is what's going to come out. And then you can choose a system that it manages that metric kind of the best. Yeah. Right. Um, so when when you what about uh, dealing with uh, portfolio committees and portfolio review committees? Have you built a lot of those? And what's some of your advice? And in how to build a high, per, you know, high performance, high functioning portfolio committee. Uh, yeah, so my experience is interesting because most of the companies I work for, there is no single. Well, there is a single owner. It tends to be the you know the global senior vice president of professional services or something like that. But the reality is that the the, the people who care about the portfolio are the regional. Uh, VPs are the uh, you know vertical VPs. It does depend on each organisation. So typically, the, my audience or the PMO's audience has always been multiple. Um, so you have to take that into account. Um, you know, the best tip I can I can provide really is just to is to, is to you know, evolve that single standard dashboard and drive you know project reviews through the tool that you're using and and, and eliminate. All of the, you know, all of the PowerPoint, all of the Word, all of the Excel, all of the whatever, you know, drive behavior. So, you know, working with those those you know, regional industry leaders and, and saying you need to run your meetings, review your projects for your clients through the, through this tool. And we get consistency at that point. Now, I must admit, uh, I had a, an, I had a real lesson I learned at one organization, um, big German engineering company. And, uh, you know, we, we developed this, this really nice dashboard. My, one of my guys on the PMO was, was an absolute whiz with SharePoint. It was amazing. I mean, he produced this, this wonderful uh, dashboard of our, our global portfolio. We're all trending and everything. It's brilliant. And um, we're about to launch it. And suddenly, um, you know, the country managers actually realized that their projects are going to be seen by everybody else. And what was fascinating was every single one of them was scared to show the reality of the health of their projects. Uh you know, I had to get the CEO involved actually to to say it's, they're not your projects, so they're the company's projects. So tough. It's going to be one dashboard. When it when we launched it live, they realised that their projects you know, had good ones and bad ones, and America had good bad and ones, and the UK had good bad ones. Everybody was just as good and just as bad as everybody else. But it was a big hurdle to get through. But again, once we got that, once we got that single source of information, single you know way of looking at the project, simple simple you know single drive down into detail. Um, you know, life just accelerated as far as the health of the projects, the understanding the projects and what we could actually do as a PMO to help thing, make things even better. Yeah, I think you bring up an interesting point because that's really where the power of the information is. Uh, I, I dubbed it the fuzzy middle layer is, is mm -hmm. what I've dubbed it between the project management and executives. It has to go through this fuzzy middle layer of translation. Um, I watched uh, uh, CA make a, a tremendous investment. It was a beautiful tool where it was an iPad driven strategy dashboard where we could put in our strategic objectives that would line up to projects. And then at any point, an executive could grab their iPad and say, how are we doing on the strategy and get real time right. information about their projects. The project managers loved it. The executives loved it. Everybody in between shut it down. And, and it turned out to be a huge failure in, in the market because they wanted the chain of command to be able to uh, delineate the message to the executive. It, it, oh, it's not that bad, or it's not that. But if it's red, it's red. Yeah. So you know, it's uh, it, it's interesting how much dilution, uh, and even uh, almost a delusion, but that's probably the same, right? Dilution yeah. and service and delusion um, is the same. What are um, what are some of the bigger political hurdles that you've had to personally overcome? in order to continue your success and in, in influence? Um, the, the PMOs tend to be, you know, hot for a while. And there, there seems to be an investment in them. Um, you know, one of, one of the exercises I do is based on a real case study, actually, you know, where the PMO was kind of challenged and threatened. And, and you know, what is the value of the PMO? And, uh, you know, I love doing that when I do, um, you know, PMO leadership uh, workshops and training. Um, because, you know, to get people to think about, you know, the, constantly think about the value. As I said, in the five Ps, you know, that yeah, promotion and performance are, are two keys there. Constantly promoting what you're doing, explaining the value, reiterating the value, and having the metrics to to to, to back that up is really important. So, you know, whenever I build a PMO, one of the first things I do is baseline the organization right now to understand 
so that you know the incremental improvements can can be there but i think the the, the real danger can be that if you make enough improvements that then you know it's like it, it's a it, it's a it's a job done you know the organizers you can look at and i you know i advocate strongly um I'm, you know I, I like to keep things really simple um, as you know rick and you know when i talk about the world of projects i describe it this way that you know a project is just doing something the right way as far as i'm concerned it's, it's, you've got you've got a project you've got an end result do it the right way you know a program is doing the right things in in you know in in the right order effectively uh, a portfolio is doing the right things for the organization uh, and the pro, you know for me a pmo is just having the right team so you know that's my utter simple definition of it but the right team you know can be quite an expensive team you know you need really experienced project managers who have the empathy and the skills to work with other project managers and resolve difficult situations to support them to guide them etc uh, to challenge them but in, a, in a, again in a very supportive way um to deliver good news and bad news all of those things and so you know one of the dangers can definitely be that the pmo is seen as a, an expense and you know yeah. okay you know you've been going three years or so and you know great progress but do we really need you anymore and that they've been some of the kind of the battles i've i've, I've worked and fought in the past um and yeah it's it's it's, it's a tough period of time i loved it actually I, yeah I, I said i worked for a german engineering company it was siemens which is huge obviously mm -hmm. and i was running the pmo during the period of time that was the financial recession uh was it 2008 2009 or whatever it was um and uh, like every other part of the organization that we were looked at very very closely and we were like many companies around the world you know we lost about six percent of our workforce at that time um and uh, i got you get a report you know with, with siemens you get a report back obviously and the report summary was that the pmo was too too valuable to keep not too valuable not to keep um but not too expensive to keep either was the second part of that report so we kind of got it right you know, to, you know we were too valuable to to uh to, to disappear but nor were we too expensive to keep around either and, and that's one of the the great balancing acts of, of pmo teams pmo leaders is to get that that investment scale and the right people at the right level to continue to support the organization and so I, I, I find that um, I, I love what you said there, because if you look around the world, you know, I look, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm a consultant and a contractor for you. And so I get pitched, you know, jobs all the time. And you know, I, I just got one recently. It's a global organization. It's, I mean, almost uh, almost a billion dollars in investment. And they were looking for a very strong PMO manager. I said, great. And they were like, and the salary that we're thinking about is around $65,000 a year. And okay. I was like, no, like good luck with that. How do we yeah. how do we continue to enable and show the value of the investment into someone like yourself? Um, I, I lost you there, Rick. I was just saying, how do we how do we educate and enable organizations to understand the value of an investment right. in somebody like yourself? Uh, I always go back to the you know the the investment in ch in change or projects you know depending on what sort of organization you've got internal projects or you know, it's investment if it's external project projects it's it's revenue and customers and margin and all that kind of stuff to truly look at that um and understand the scale of the investment whilst it might look quite significant it isn't really i mean it's, it's quite insignificant really i mean you know the biggest pmo team i've had in in we like direct reports has been uh, eight people you know that's the biggest um, now we had dotted line to you know quite a lot of project managers who reported up around the world through their own uh, regional organisation. So, but the you know if you like the sunk cost of the PMO was was that was that team and that was by far the biggest. But when you looked at it against the scale of the in that case the revenue that was coming in of projects into the organisation, and then and, and then I think you know any organisation needs to look at their portfolio and what I what I talk about is calculating true portfolio value. So externally, yes, it might be, you know, let's say you've got, you know, let's say you've got 20 million in in revenue coming in from your from your projects. Well, yeah, but customers you want to keep, you know, they, you know, you want to renew business, you want this, you know, the consequence of doing it wrong is it. And so you can quickly, you know, escalate that 20 million that you know, easily up to you know, 60, 80 million. If you're talking about internal projects, 
Then, you know, I talk about, well, you know, if you've got compliance projects going on, what's the consequence of failure? If you've got, you know, uh, market growth strategy ones, there should be something like a four to one return on investment. You know, what if, what about the, um, you know, disruption to the business, if you get it wrong, et cetera. Uh, you know, you can quickly take a, you know, a 20 million portfolio and turn it into 100, 120 million portfolio of true portfolio value. So one of the things I think is, you know, work that out. You know, work that, work that out, what that truly means to the business, because it's not just your sunk costs in the project uh, based on activity and resources. There's a lot more to it. Um, if you do that, then it kind of you kind of get a better scale against any investment. And but I mean, you know, counter that, you've also got to constantly provide um, evidence and uh, you know, promotion of the value of the PMO. And you've got to keep that PMO on track, on target for what the organization needs. It's not a fixed thing either, PMOs. It's one of the great things. Yeah, right. they're constantly evolving. So what's what's an unconventional thought uh, or thing that you feel like you've developed that you can share? For example, um, you know, I'm I'm a big advocate against lessons learned, not the activity of it, just what happens afterwards, right? Normally, yeah. they just, they just, you know, SharePoint site, and we're supposed to go read it before next project. Nobody ever does. So, yeah. I took the information and turned that into a risk assessment, so I could ask questions to avoid those lessons to my. So, if you've never run a project for me in my PMO, you are right. essentially getting, you know, the the worst of the worst issues asked up front to help avoid them. Do you have a system of something that you consider is somewhat unconventional in the way that it does it, but it operationalizes the data or the process or just something in a much better way in your PMOs? Well, I think you can, I can, I can speak to that as one example. So, you know, I, you know, I've had the same experience, you know, you know I, I'm a strong, actually, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong advocate of retrospectives, you know, like mm -hmm. that kind of lessons learned is one thing. Retrospectives are kind of a common sharing and, and, and learning. And I think they're, they're really valuable. But, you know, I worked in an organization and we had the same problem because, you know, the, you know everyone was saying, well, we need to have lessons learned, lessons shared, et cetera. You know, well, that's great. But, you know, we're working around the world. I don't know how many countries we're working projects in. But, you know, we're talking about multiple languages. Um, you know, and the other thing is, you know, is this actually, um, you know, a true lesson that we can repeat or is this just something that you, you know, was, was a bit of a survival technique in this particular project, you know? So the effort of, of creating a you know, group of people to evaluate that and decide what is truly is, you know, the term used to be, you know, best practice um, was really, really enormous. You know, I, I worked in one company and we had, I think they had about 10 people in that team and, you know, the company was very disappointed because they were getting maybe one or two best practices produced a month, but the sheer work in kind of sif sifting through and working out and was it valid? Was it valuable? Anyway, what we actually came up with was a very simple thing is that we decided, you know what, this is great. And in your project team, you do that. You, you have your lessons learned, you have the reflection period of time and you, you learn from experience, but actually globally, this isn't going to work. So what we want from you actually is the one risk or the, the, or the one issue that occurred that you did not expect, and how did you deal with it? And we put those into the database. That was a single thing we asked the project manager to do at the end. Record that issue, tell us how, what you did, how you circumvented it, and tell us a bit about the project. So there's a bit of a you know, profile of the project. Put that into a database. And then when other, other project managers were starting their, their project and going through their, you know, their risk uh, management sort of assessment that, we, that they need to go through, they had something simple to look at. They go, well, it, my project's a bit like this one. Oh, that's interesting. I, you know, I, I didn't know that because you know the worst project managers, and, and we, you know, I'm sure nobody listens to this is like that. But you know, you finish the project and then you start a new project and you go right, okay, risk plan. Oh, hang on, cut, paste. Okay, done. Yeah. Move on. That's meaningless. So you know, it's far. I mean, the essence behind that is, and you know, you know, the lazy project manager. I talk about productive laziness. I talk about working smarter, not harder. The the essence behind, or the idea behind this, really, was the fact that do one thing well and do one thing regularly and it will benefit people as opposed to overwhelming people with you know hundreds of possible help which they're never going to look at anyway so let's let's switch gears a little bit uh coming back to speaking for a moment you know yeah. you and i've both been in this game you know for quite some time i was speaking five or six for five or six years before i met you i i know you were doing the same um tell me a story of where something happened either running back into somebody or somebody reached out to you or whatever that was just really touching to you just that kind of moment as a speaker where somebody said you know you've changed my career changed my life you know, something of that sort that that, okay, yeah. you know, that that you really remember yeah um 
Actually, I mean, it's not a speaking one, actually. It's to do with the book. But, I mean, I've had some really nice stuff at, at uh, speaking events, etc. But this this one guy was, um, you know, he just he just reached out to me one day and he said, um, um, you know, I just got to tell you, he said, I was, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was, at, I was at university, I was doing my degree, et cetera. And, you know, he said, um, and I, you know, someone gave me a copy of the Lazy Project Manager. He said, well, I didn't buy the copy. He said, I was just flicking through it and I just opened the page and there on that page was something that just made an offer clarity to something I was, I was, I was struggling with. And he said, you know, seriously, you know, it was a moment that kind of, he said, I was, I was really having a bit of a difficulty. I was a low point during, during my, my, my time there. And suddenly he said, it was a, it was a moment that kind of, oh, wow, I get that. And I like, and then I read the book straight after that. And I just loved the way you were thinking. So when people reach out to you that, like that, and you, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a small little book. It's thirty thousand words, and you know, and it's amazing. And 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 yet that book has taken me around the world. I mean, and the other story I love to tell is, I think it was about five years into to having had the book published, etc. You know, I was sitting in Auckland, in New Zealand, having been invited to a conference, and I was meeting new people and having a, having a great time. And, and you kind of sit there and think that, wow, just because I wrote a few words down a bit of, on some paper and I persuaded someone to publish it here I am. And I've, you know, I've been blessed to be able to go to 25 countries so far and done over 400 presentations. So you meet some amazing people. I love doing it. You know, unfortunately that, that travel bit doesn't happen these days and hopefully it will come back at some point. Um, but you know, this, this new virtual media offers opportunities as well. I think one of the advantages of it is it can actually, you can reach even more people than, than would necessarily turn up and to a conference having paid for a, you know, the ticket. Yeah, it's it's it, it's an interesting world, isn't it? To 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 do that, both yeah. of us. Uh, and, and so, I actually want to challenge the audience for a moment, Peter, because for me, I had the very similar experience that motivated me to do what I do, which is I was at a low point in my career. I was thinking of quitting project management. I'm walking through a Barnes and Noble, looking at job titles, like what could I do next? And uh, I, I grabbed a book called Radical Project Management by Rob Tomset. And his quote that projects fail because of context, not content, was the exact phrase I needed to read. And it oh. changed my entire career. And since Rob has become a friend, somebody I've reached out to. Um, so I challenged the audience, if there is ever anything you've ever read or a piece of, of writing that inspired you, that changed the way you think, reach out to that author. You, 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 they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're us. They're, they're normal guys that are just walking around that nobody even knows. We can go to the store. Nobody knows who we are. Um, but uh, it really makes a difference. So I challenge the audience that if you've ever read anything or anything has really moved you. And so I'm going to, I'm going to phrase the next question that way for you, Peter, what is something that you read or something that just was really impactful, a book, an author, uh, something maybe you should suggest the audience uh, to read oh, other than a, the lazy project manager. Well, obviously the lazy project manager. <laughs> I, was, I already had that one down. One of the books that is in the lazy, I recommend the lazy project manager is uh, Brian Tracy's book, eat that frog. Yeah. I just love it. It's all about procrastination. It's all about getting on with things, etc. It's you know, if it's it's based on a, a Native American Indian uh, saying that if you eat a frog first thing in the morning, your day is going to get better. I don't think anybody argues with that. Brian takes that and he and he does some great things with it, and he does some simple techniques. It's funny. It's short. It's insightful. And I you know I guess it worked for me because I liked it as a book. It kind of you know kind of helped me definitely. Um, but it also kind of inspired me in a kind of style that you could write a book, and that kind of led to uh, the Lazy Project Manager. And you know, and it is, you know, it is you know, the Lazy Project Manager was a very, very different book than anything else that was out there at the time because it's got dinosaurs, field marshals, Monty Python. It's a lot of crazy stuff in it. But people seem to like it because it, you know, it's short, it's funny, but kind of you know where you 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 are questioning me earlier on, Rick. It's, it it has some very honest stories of, of mistakes, and I when I when I came to write that book or before that every book i'd read on project management was was dull and yeah. uh, and i clearly hadn't read your book by then rick but every other book was dull and it, it presented a world of perfection like every you know there is no failure and, it, and it's just you know it's complete and utter rubbish um so yeah but eat that frog i, I the other story i love to tell is i've been telling that people that all all around the world and i suddenly found myself in paris telling people to eat the frog uh, and uh, the, yeah, they felt about laughing because, of course, they do that anyway. So I guess Brian tells <laughs> it well there. Yeah, well, it, it, it did the frog. It is very good, you know. <laughs> Sorry, French-speaking audience out there. That was terrible. 
If Rob's uh, Rob's book was the first one that made me laugh, and that's the one that gave me the inspiration of we can be humorous, we can be fun, we can be, and, and I felt like that's why you and I connected in New York City. Very similar styles, very similar message, but we like to to have a laugh at ourselves and at the audience, and kind of riff at the moment of of what's going on and and, and make jokes. So maybe for a question, some, maybe a question for you, for me. So because because I get this onto this, you know, it's it's about consumable knowledge. And I, and I was kind of mentored by uh, a, a guy who was a speaker. He's not actually a professional speaker, but I, I knew him in business. And he was, he was always so good. And I asked him, and he said, look, Peter, when you, go and, when you do presentations, you know, and I'm not talking about your, your steering group updates and stuff like that. When you're doing a you know, presentation, he said 80% entertainment, 20% information. Oh, yeah. If you engage your audience like that, then they will, they will want more, they will read more, they will ask you more, et cetera. And, I, and I'm guessing the same is, is true because I've seen you speak as well, Rick. For sure. And and I'll tell you, the biggest technical breakthrough I heard, and, and I'd been speaking 10 years or 11 years, um, was to chart the energy of this speech. Meaning, uh, and at the time that that was told to me, I would come out just like gangbusters, just joke, 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 joke. But then there would be like 20, 25 minutes where it was mm -hmm. the teaching and learning, and then it was light on the other side. And so I've, I've had to learn how to intersplice that to where um, it's about three to five minutes of entertainment, that 30 second minute point that I'm trying to go and then move yeah. again. So charting that energy so yeah. that you, you don't, cause I watched so many people start well and then they just dive right on down. Yeah. Like by the end, you're like, mm -hmm. you know, I, so I, was, I was challenged by someone that, uh, not so long ago, actually, he goes, well, you, I, I've been, I, I sat through your presentation, but you taught me nothing. And I said, well, okay. So and then I, I sort of picked up one point. And I said, did you pick? He goes, yeah, yeah, that was quite good. And another thing, yeah, that was quite good. And eventually, yeah, we ended up with like six or seven things that he had actually learned or, or, or reminded him. And, I, and he said, oh, I didn't realize. That. I said, well, again, I said, I said, I wrapped it up with so much fun. You didn't realize we were learning. And, and you know, that's, that's kind of how we all learn. You know, I love anything you can gamify, anything you can make fun and enjoyable. It, it just, it allows a learning process to be so much better as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Yeah. So there, there is a possibility that people are watching this right now that do, do not know who you are and what you've done for this profession. So if you could just, when we talk about an influence of the year, again, uh, if, if we had the opportunity to vote, you'd have my vote. You're a dear friend, but I've looked up to you for so long as to what you've actually meant to this profession. One of the things that we sign in the PMI Code of Ethics is that, that we're going to give back. And, mm -hmm. and I know nobody who gives back like you do in the, in the sheer amount of content that, that you produce. Um, but just run me through, you know, here we are sitting in September, mm -hmm. just what you've kind of done this year, just high level projects, how many things you're involved with, how many pieces of content that went out, that kind of thing. Wow. That's a hard thing. I mean, you know, <laughs> as you know, I, you know, I tend to post pretty much daily on LinkedIn. So anybody out there, Connect to me on LinkedIn, and you're gonna you're gonna get swamped with stuff. So that, that's definite. Um, I oh gosh, I can't remember. I think I've done uh, you know because again, you know, come March we switched to a completely virtual world, uh, make things a little bit easier. But you know, on a typical year, I'm doing about fifty presentations. Uh, I think I've done probably about eighty in total this year so far. Um, you know, some of the fun things we've done. Um, you know, I wrote a book a long time ago, which is the Project Manager Who Smiles. The, you know, the power of fun on projects. And I just want to kind of like a mini virtual roadshow, just, you know, giving that away for three months, you know, doing a webinar after webinar, giving the book away to anybody. That kind of stuff was great fun to do. We had a lot of fun in lockdown. I got, uh, uh, I reached out to the project management community out there and uh, it's, it's fantastic. I think I've got about 30,000 followers on LinkedIn now. I just asked the question. I said, look, let's have some fun. We, we, we're going to write a book in 21 days. Um, and and we did. You know, I got I got well, I don't know what it was about 100 and so people came back and said they would. You know, maybe about I think about 60 of them actually contributed 500 words. We put it in a book. We got it published through Amazon. Uh, it's available. It's called the Projectless Manager. Um, it's a 21 day challenge, um, and that was done for charity, for example. So, you know, and you know, we have to make a living, and you know, I, I make a living by my speaking professionally at, at some uh, events and conferences, and for businesses, and I do coaching and I do uh, training stuff like that. But typically, you know, probably you know half of what I do every year is because I'm come inspired to do it, you know, and speak at local chapter meetings and stuff like that, or do interviews um, and all, you know, all those sort of things. And it was, 
I'm going to reflect back when I when I when we first when I first wrote the Lazy Project Manager, my publisher said, "Look, we're going to launch the book," and he said, "Then and, and, and like after a month after it's launched, we're going to make it free." And I said, oh, "What? Wait, where, what about royalties? They could, there won't be any." And I was like, "He said, I said, but everybody have the book." He said, "No, they won't. Trust me, give it away. If you give it away, it's amazing what people will value." And the number of people who who were given the free ebook, and we weren't doing printed copies, obviously, ebook, etc., and then went off and bought the actual hard copy was was just amazing. And and I kind of followed that in in doing my podcast, in doing my speaking, etc. That you can't just take. That's for sure. Um, you know, as I said, we I, I need to make a living. Um, you know, I have to look after my family. Um, but you know, do stuff, give stuff away. And the last thing I say, I think, is. Yeah, Rick, it's kind of like you said, I, I was very fortunate. I, I think every single person I've ever reached out to, and it's so easy to do that these days, mm-hmm. you know, with the lead team for, as just one example, everybody I've reached out to in who were my kind of authorities in project management, you know, Harold Kersner, Frank Saladis, just a couple of people like that. There's, been, there's many, many more. All of them have come back and offered something. And I try and do the same these days. I mean, sometimes, you know, I can, you know, I can wake up in the morning and there's, there's 20 emails or whatever for people, e-LinkedIn messages. You, you can't do too much. But I, 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 you know, I totally agree that there is a community out there. We all want to do great things. So don't be shy. Do do re- reach out to people. You know, don't demand stuff. Or, but, you know, ask nicely. And, we, you know, I know Rick does it as well. Um, you know, we try and give as much back as we possibly can. Because you know we love this profession and we want it to we want it to grow yeah in fact in in, in um, uh, we're blessed being speakers and be able to run in these circles to meet so i've had the opportunity to develop a relationship with jim snyder mm-hmm. who is pmi member number four yeah. right and one of the founding four members times. yeah yeah wonderful wonderful guy and and, and uh i had to follow it, it, follow me on a conference in australia it was just you know one of the tougher gigs <laughs> yeah for <laughs> sure for sure um who's who's somebody um that you've been able to speak or share a stage with that you were just, you know, excited to, to, to meet, right. They're, they're, like, I like almost like you were Fanny. Like I got a chance to speak with uh, Richard Branson. I, I've been up there with uh, Dr. Stephen Covey and I actually made a joke on Dr. Stephen Covey that he didn't find funny, but he was the opening keynote. I was the second keynote and oh, I thanked right, him okay. for opening for me um, as if we were like in a comedy troupe and I was the headliner and he did not find that funny at all. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, who, who's who been somebody that you've gotten a chance to speak or share? Well, no, with I so, Harold, Dr. Harold Kersner was great. I mean, you know, he's such, a, such an authority. Um, yeah, his books are way bigger than mine. Yeah. <laughs> we exchanged books once, and like his books like that thing, and I floated the lazy project. Project. Like, well, your your whole catalog yeah, didn't meet. Oh, his. <laughs> he, he's written more words in one book than I've written in twenty books. I tell you, um, but I, I started laughing there because I was fortunate enough. I went to I was speaking at the uh, digital PM conference uh, last year in Orlando, and so the, yeah, the person that I I managed to share a stage with, I'm um, having got. Uh, I don't know, it was about 400 uh, members of the audience. We I got them to sing uh, "Let It Go" from Frozen, so we had a lot of fun. But the, yeah, I, I share the stage with Mickey Mouse. I mean, oh, nice! You know, that's it. I mean, that's it. You know, drop the mic. We're done. I mean, where, where do you go after that? It, the, the, with my history in in working for Disney and being a, a kid of the kingdom at eleven, you, you, there's a lot of stories about Mickey Mouse you just may not want to hear. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't ruin it. Don't ruin my moment. Don't, don't, don't ruin the magic. Um, what's some of the best advice that you've ever received? Um, no surprises. That, that, there's a guy I work for in my very early days. I've not realized, and I was a project manager, and he wasn't a project manager. But he was very simple. He said, Peter, just no surprises. And he said, the point is, he said, if you come to me with a problem, we work on it and we will solve the problem. If someone else comes to me with this problem and you knew about it or you should have known about it, then we will have a different conversation. So I think it was that. Like, you know, I spent a lot of time. And I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the problems a lot of project managers face is they get so detailed in the weeds, in the, in the detail, in the muck, in the mud, et cetera, because they're trying to help out. But project managers have always got to elevate and just keep looking at the horizon, what's coming, what's likely to come, what's likely to happen, what else is happening elsewhere across the organization, what's going to blindside you. And so this sort of uh, approach of like trying to avoid, I'm not saying that I've never had surprises, they have been, but they've been very few. Um, you know, or when they've been surprises, they've been early surprises and, and more manageable. So even, I think better said, even better said, it was a surprise to you. 
as yeah. well as that person, right? Yeah, it's not totally, like yeah, you yeah, knew it, true. and yeah. it was a surprise to him, right? So I don't, I don't know. It just it just resonated with me. It's such a simple revi- uh, piece of advice, um, and yeah, that's amazing. I mean, the other one was, of course, the guy who insulted me, my boss. We'd worked in three companies together, and he, he said I was the laziest person he ever met. And I, I sulked for about six months, and then realized that was a compliment. Um, and that that really was the you know I, I then started writing the book, and the lazy project manager was born. Anything that you would change in your career? Oh, that's one of the really hard ones, isn't it? I mean, I don't know. I just, I don't know. It, you know, anything you change is going to change what you already had, et cetera. So, yeah, maybe maybe I would have, I would have liked to have written the book earlier, but would it, would it have been the same book? You know, it's one of those really fortu- fortuitous moments. You know, I, I had this idea of a book. I had this frustration with what, you know, how people were speaking about project management, a frustration about the books about project management. And by sheer laziness and luck, you know, I I, I, I was given the um, the literary uh, yearbook, which is the book, you know, I guess it's a global thing, but with the UK, it's a book that has all of the literary agents, all of the publishers, what books they publish, et cetera. And I sat there after Christmas. I went back from, to work uh, between Christmas and New Year. And I was just reading this. And, and I, there's no way I was going to write letters to people. So, you know, I picked 10 that would, I could apply to online and 10 literary agents I could apply to online. I got a response, I think, within like five minutes from one saying, absolutely not interested at all, go away sort of thing. Um, but someone, a literary agent read it. He passed it on to someone he knew who was like, set it, who was moving. They they were they were existing publishers, but they were moving into uh, business books. And on it had this long list of subjects. One of them was project management. But the beauty of it was they, I, they said, yeah, we kind of like it. You can write it. Um, we have nothing, no idea about it. So the editing was almost zero oh, and wow. i was able to write the book that I, that I that i wrote the lazy project manager which is the one that still outsells every other book i've ever written but it was the foundation for everything else i've done so you know uh would i done it earlier possibly but would the same thing happen would it be the same book would i have been allowed to write the ridiculous thing i did that people love possibly not so you can't you can't regret or, or think like that so we certainly i i think the the time of the book when it came out the, the message that it had, it was perfect, right? So writing it earlier. But if I were to ask you to write the Lazy Project Manager 2.0, would you change anything of that book today? There is, I mean, I wrote the second edition. I did write, and, and there was a couple of things. I didn't talk about risk particularly. I did that. I can't remember what else. There's a couple of things in there. I, I did add to it, to be honest, um, based on, on sort of feedback from people and my own thoughts, et cetera. But fundamentally... No, I read. I, I'll be honest. I reread it probably yeah, beginning of last year actually, and it's interesting. We write these books and we talk about them, and, and we don't often go back and actually reread them. I did, um, uh, and yeah, no, I don't think so really. I mean, one of the other crazy things with it, which people love, is the you know the quick tips to productive lazy heaven at the end, where I applied the eighty twenty rule to the book itself. The only reason I did that, Rick. It's because I didn't have enough words when I finished the manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> and people love it. <laughs> it was a filler, but people love it. So there you go. Yeah, it, you know, it's it, it, interesting that, uh, again, John Maxwell is a, a mentor of mine. And, and he said, you know, when he wrote, when he writes books, it's the very best that you have, but it's the very best that you have at the time. And then you grow and you have new experiences, new thing. He, he was under contract to do, uh, just to do a revision of developing the leader within you. Uh, and last year just released that as a 2.0 because he rewrote 85% of the book because he doesn't think that way anymore. Uh, and I just found that fascinating as that's a great marker in time. So when I, I read something, there's certainly chapters in my book that I wouldn't include in a 2.0 uh, okay. now because I've grown and learned and, and it's, I don't believe in some of those things anymore. Um, what's some final words that you can, you can leave with the audience to inspire them to continue this amazing profession that we've, we've been blessed to be a part of. Oh God, it, look, it, it's, it is, an amazing, it's an amazing profession. It does amazing things. And, you know, I've been saying this for years, but actually it's, it's, it's in, increasingly true. This, I think, is, is the most exciting time to be in project management, to join project management. It's a recognized profession. It's doing amazing things. You know, it's, it's going to grow. Yeah, the world is becoming far more projectified. Um, 
you know, AI is going to come in and do amazing things for project management. And uh, that's something I've been talking about recently. Um, I think, you know, project team performance management, you know, the, the analytics of your behavior of your project team is going to be huge as well. Um, you know, there's, there's other stuff. Um, I don't know. It's just so exciting. So, you know, embrace it, embrace it and, and you know, read and learn and connect. I think don't be an isolated project manager and that can be, you know, don't be just a project manager inside your own organization, talking to your own organization's other project managers, you know, connect. There are, I mean, I keep talking about LinkedIn. It's just, you know, it's, it's the foundation of my sort of social world, but, you know, go to you know, local chapter meetings, go to communities, connect to communities, join LinkedIn, join LinkedIn group, you know, Twitter, you know, PMOT project managers on Twitter. There's so much out there and reach out to people and consume those books and, and you know, attend those virtual conferences. There's an amazing amount that actually right now is free as well. So there's no there's no real argument for not doing it. It's just a matter of investing your time. But it's just, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, I think we're leaving it in, you know, when we do uh, finally retire, you and me, Rick, should that ever happen? You know, I think the next generation, you know, they mean, they mean it. They're pro they are not accidental project managers. They are intentional project managers, and they can only do great things, I think. Well, Peter, I've enjoyed spending some time with you. I wish you luck in the award. Thank you so much for being a friend and a mentor to me as well. And uh, we'd like to thank the PMO Global Alliance as well for the nomination and uh, making sure that uh, people get to know Peter if you haven't, or maybe you know him a little bit better if you do. So thank you so much, gang, and uh, we'll talk to everyone next time.